and that results in a rate of 5%. That's the lowest recorded in the literature of all unstable slips. Surgical dislocation, which is a newer technique of, of p putting it all back together, but doing an osteotomy of the neck, a done procedure, a modified done procedure, results in a rate of 8%. So it's still, it's not gold standard anyway. And then, as usual with all these reviews, you said you need more series and need to combine all our cases. So when you look at his paper and you look at all the references and you look at surgical, you look at the done procedure. The done procedure is doing a subcapital osteotomy, an osteotomy of the neck and then reducing the neck onto the head. And in the non-modified done or the original done, that's done through an anterolateral approach, like a Watson-Jones approach. Some people have modified the approach slightly and done a more anterior approach through a modified Salter or modified Smith-Peterson approach because it's more cosmetic and it's directly onto the neck. Um, but the AVN rate, at its lowest, when done urgently, is 5%. The modified done is doing the same thing but through a surgical dislocation approach. You take the trochanter off, a trochanteric flip, and then you go in, dislocate the hip, and put it back on. And that the AVN rates varied from the originator series being zero, which is always worrying when someone says that, to 33%. But there's been more literature recently, so we'll, we'll discuss all of it. So the, the, the gold standard paper of what, what's best practice is if you can get to a hip as quickly as possible, ideally within 24 hours. These, this group in Stuttgart were getting to it within 6 to 12 hours most of the time. And that has issues. You know, for us to get to our urgent, unstable slips within 6 to 12 hours is unheard of. I mean, they don't come to us or get to our hospital by that time, let alone get to theatre. And that's doing an anterior approach. And this is Klaus Pasch's finger. You use your finger to put the neck back onto the head and fix it with three smooth KYs. And their rate was 5%, which is extremely low. Someone tried to repeat this. So this is from uh, St. Louis, so Schoenecker again, and Eric Gordon, and they tried to repeat it in 28 patients with 30 unstable slips, so a couple of bilaterals. They went urgent reduction and fixation, but this time they fixed it with 6.5 screws. And then in most, many of the cases, they did an arthrotomy or let out the hematoma, but not all cases. And for them, four patients, which is 13%, developed AVN. So again, a low rate, even though some of them didn't have an evacuation of the tight hematoma. So it's still a low, you know, it's a good thing to do. But it probably could have been better if they had done a hematoma in all cases, evacuation. So lots of people have tried surgical dislocation and the modified done procedure. Uh, Woody Sanker, who's based in um, Children's in Philadelphia, CHOP, Children's Hospital Philadelphia, got all the centers in Northern Europe that do these, Northern America that do these cases to put all their cases together and look at the overall AVN rate for surgical dislocation. And they found with 27 patients um, with a, with a follow-up of at least uh, 12 months, but up to 48 months, a quarter of them, 26% develop osteonecrosis. So they said, you've got to be really careful. Uh, it's a great procedure, but there are problems. You know, it's not, it, it's not as low as Klaus Pasch's finger. Uh, Christina Alves, who's in, where is she, is she in Coimbra? No, yeah. Yeah, in Coimbra in Portugal. When she was a fellow at Toronto Children's Hospital, Toronto Sick Kids, and that's Uni Narayanan, Ben Allman, and Jim Wright, looked at a bunch of cases they did with surgical dislocation to try and put it back, and found that their AVN rate um, in the open reduction, which is the done operation using surgical dislocation, was 66.7%. And in the closed reduction, and just pinning, it was 33%. So they abandoned the use of surgical dislocation and said, either you have to be so experienced and great that everything you're doing is perfect, or for, for the average person, these aren't average people, these are some of the top pediatric orthopedic surgeons, the rate is unacceptably high. Having said that, recently Sanjeev Madan, who works in Sheffield, who's one, there's three centres in the UK, where one Sheffield is one and Bristol's another, where we do surgical dislocations. He looked at 28 patients that they, they did modified done surgical dislocations on, and 
only two of those who, were, who already were shown to be dead before the operation. So they had an MRI scan preoperatively which showed the femoral head was dead. Those two continued to be dead after the operation. So they didn't create any new death. So, you know, it may well be a promising procedure. So the options really are when you've got this dislocated hip and you can't get to it within 24 hours and reduce it, release the hematoma and fix it, is you have to think about open reductions. And the options are you can go through an anterolateral approach, which is a Watson-Jones approach, and do a Dunn or a Fish, and they're both very similar. You take a cuneiform piece of bone out of the femoral neck and reduce the neck onto the head. You can do it through an anterior approach, or you can do it through a surgical dislocation approach. I won't ask you guys to vote, but we'll go through the evidence. So you can look at Fish or Dunn, it doesn't matter. This is Fish's paper from the American JBJS, and and these are the classic papers where it's one, a single author reviewing his lifetime's work. And he had 82 patients with 106 hips with slipped epiphysis, stable and unstable. Remember, there was no classification of stability at that point. Uh, this was in the 90s, early 90s. Um, out of all of them, avascular necrosis developed in one femoral head and osteoarthritis in one hip. But remember, it was one person reviewing all his own cases. But that's why people started doing the fish or the done. Um, most other groups that have started to reproduce this, the most recent paper, this is from Paris, um, have found a rate of up to 17% if you use an anterior or antrilateral approach and reduce the hip and fix it. So it's, it's not unacceptable, but it's still not perfect. We, t we tend to do it in different ways. We used to do it, so I used to do it through an anterior approach, so this is my approach, anterior, like a modified Smith-Peterson or bikini line incision, and you go down to the hip, and under direct vision, you take a piece out of the front and then reduce the neck onto the head and fix it. So you take a case like that, which is completely off, and you can reduce it back on and then it looks very nice. But what you need is preoperative imaging to show that the blood supply is okay or not okay before you do it. Because what you don't really want to do is take a good blood supply and make it into a bad blood supply. More recently, so the last 14 cases that we've done, we've done through a surgical dislocation approach. So this is one example. This is a girl we did six weeks ago. Six weeks ago. So unstable hip. Um, right side, it's off. It's at least 60 degrees. You get an MRI scan pre-op that shows the deformity and where it's lying. And also shows that the vascularity isn't incredible compared to the other side. And also shows you the effusion, by the way, around the hip. So she came at, this was done within the first day of her coming. To surgical dislocation, you take off the trochanter, you then um, pin, temporarily pin the neck to the head, so they're together, and then you dislocate the hip, and then you realign it and fix it back on with screws. And then you then put the trochanter back, but lengthen the neck at the same time. So you give them back their neck length. So it's a neck lengthening osteotomy at the same time as a reduction. And our protocol, and this is something that we're doing, so ourselves and Sydney, we're, we're doing this as a sort of prospective series, um, Sydney Children's Hospital, is to get a, a post-op bone scan and a SPECT scan, which is a, a 3D CT scan. So the bone scan shows you what the femoral head looks like, and the SPECT scan shows you the perfusion more clearly. So I'll just zoom in on that. So you can see the hip has got blood flow coming into it post-op. And then you're not worried about it. So six weeks down the line, she looks like this. And you know, it's, when it goes well, it goes really well. Because you almost restore the normal anatomy of the hip. So my question is what you do with someone who's not unstable. Next. So you've got a hip that has been slowly slipping 
and you've got this sort of deformity that's form it's not fallen off, they're still walking and it's been going on for nine months. And really there you've got two options. You either fix it where it is, so just put a screw in like this from the front all the way in, or you do an osteotomy and then you fix it. So how many people would, for these chronic and stable severe slips, how many people would fix it inside you? And how many people would do a corrective osteotomy and then fix it? Okay. So the literature is all over the place, <laughs> as always. This is, this is from UCLA, so San Francisco, uh, Mohammed Diab. And they looked at two strategies. So they didn't leave them alone and just fix them. They did something, but they did two types of osteotomies. They either did an intertrochanteric osteotomy, so below the lesser trochanter, Oh, sorry, in, the less, uh, in between the trochanters, but below the head. Or subcapital, right next to the head, like a fish or a dun. For severe, stable, chronic slip purposes. And they showed that the incidence of osteonecrosis and chondrolysis is low in both groups. But more reoperation was needed in the subcapital osteotomy than in the flexion into trochanters. So the closer you came to the femoral head, and did an osteotomy, the more likely you are to cause problems from having to go in and take the screws out because they're in the neck and impinging to causing problems such as chondrolysis or avascular necrosis. So they think if you're going to do an osteotomy, you should do it at the intertrochanteric level. There is a move, and the Scandinavians and the French have done some work on this, for using screws in this situation which allow remodeling. So most of the screws we tend to use have the threads distally or all the way through, fully threaded. This is, this is a screw by a French company called Medicalex. And it's where the screw is proximally threaded, but distally not threaded. So you can continue to grow. And particularly if you've got a chronic stable slip, you may well remodel that out. There's a lot of good work from Sweden, Gunnar Haglund's group in Sweden, in Lund, showing that if you follow these mild to moderate slips, maybe not the severe ones, mild to moderate, over the years when they've used smooth pins or things that allow growth, that they tend to remodel their, their femoral head. Uh, there's also a company called Pega Medical, based in the States, that have made this screw, which threads into the proximal uh, femur and into the head, and the shanks of the screws move in and out of each other, so they glide. So it's a gliding screw that allows growth. Uh, hasn't ever been used in humans as yet. So it, it's about to get its FDA and EC approval next year, so January. And we'll try it. Um, so I was just saying at the beginning, I'll just finish off by saying at the beginning, we decided as in the UK to try and start a trial of every single slip that comes into any UK hospital. And we tend to get between 500 to 600 a year. We've worked this out. And it's called a BOSS trial. So the British orthopedic slipped sur slipped to bifidus surgery trial, uh, and we're planning to start it in June next year. And it, it'll cost a lot of money to run, as you can imagine. So we've, we've applied for this massive grant, but it, there'll be there are 25 major centres in the UK which do the whole range of slip surgery, from basic pinning to osteotomies to anything to cover the whole range of slips. So our plan is a standard slip, and not the slips which are very young or have some endocrinopathy or other problems. Standard slips, they're either unstable or stable. If they're unstable, when they come to our hospital, whichever hospital that is, uh, one of the centers, they will be randomized into fix now or fix later. So fix it immediately, and that's within 24 hours. Or they get rested till everything calms down, and then you do a fixation with an open reduction. And then the mild to moderate slips, which are less than 60 degrees, and they're stable, we either fix it with the standard screw that we use, which is a fully threaded cantilated screw, or with the new screw, which is proximally threaded, to see if two to five years down the line whether it remodels. And for the severe slips, the severe stable slips, whether we fix it with a screw and do nothing else, and then see what happens to them later, or whether you do an, an osteotomy and fix it, and they get randomized into those groups. So this is the plan. And then we obviously have to follow them up for till skeletal maturity. So you can imagine the study is going to take, if, if the youngest is 
10 years old, they have to get the skeletal maturity when they're 16, and then they have to be followed up for a couple of years after. So it'll take six to eight years on average to get a result. But I think we need to do something like this, otherwise everything that we're doing is case series based and we have no comparisons. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Any questions? Is there, I, yeah. I think it's still uh, uh, very difficult because all these uh, cases that we have, it's uh, your own cases, your own series, so it's very difficult to get a trend. But what is your feeling mm -hmm. uh, on a daily basis? You know, if you have an acute sleep, what, what do you do? Because I think, for example, this study that you have either, because I know that in the UK people tend to put the children in traction and uh, no, not no. Anymore. So they used to, the no but bed rest on slings and springs. So slings and springs uh, from the top of the bed. So just re resting rather than traction. But that's a very, that's, that philosophy comes from Stanmore, from the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital. And then most people who've trained in Stanmore have gone out and carried on using that philosophy. And that comes from, mainly from Tony Catterall. There's no evidence behind it. But what they tend to, and the reason they do that is because they don't have an emergency department. They're an elective hospital. So the cases that come to them will never come within 24 hours. Will always come three, four days down the line. So what they tend to do is wait to about two weeks or 10 days and then do it after a period of rest with slings and springs. So no one uses traction. Um, most people, the sort of people who have now trained outside of Stanmore and have been consultants for a little bit now, have learned their techniques in places like Australia, Canada, North America, and have come back and are moving towards things like surgical dislocation and acute operations. So this is my ninth year. In my first three or four years, or in the first five years, I did everything through an anterior approach. Whatever time it came, it didn't matter, anterior approach, and had done stroke fish operation and reduction. And in the last few years, surgical dislocation. And we're just trying to compare historical to now rather than run a trial because once this trial gets going that doesn't have surgical dislocation in it so everyone in the UK will use one of these strategies you can use surgical dislocation so it doesn't say which approach to use it just says you have to get it reduced so we can do whichever one so we're trying to work out at our institution whether we should be putting someone through surgical dislocation as because it's a big procedure or whether we do our standard anterior open and the only way we can do that is to audit our results of our historical cohort versus our current cohort. And then we'll say, okay, from now on we'll only do X or, Z, X or Y. But my feeling at the moment is that I could, I could do an anterior approach and a done um, or fish and a fixation within an hour. A surgical dislocation takes two to two and a half hours. The scar is much bigger. It's 15 centimeters. An anterior approach is bikini line. They don't see it, and they have a small scar where you put your screws in. The screws we don't tend to take out in the anterior approach. The surgical dislocation kids tend to be more irritated around the trochanter, whether it's bursitis or whether it's metal work, and you often end up having to take those screws out. Um, the recovery is longer in terms of weight bearing because you have to wait for the trochanteric osteotomy to heal as well, and it doesn't always heal within six weeks. So my current feeling as we're going through it is it's a much bigger procedure to put someone through. Even though the x-rays look nicer, uh, I'm not convinced that it's as brilliant as it is for the patient. So I don't know. Well, I don't know what your feeling is at the moment. Oh, uh, my answer would be like yours. I don't know. Yeah, okay. But to tell the truth, because I also did some done procedures uh, you know, some time ago, and uh, I never had an, any AVN by doing a done. Mm. But I have uh, one AVN with a surgical dislocation already. Mm. But it was also a patient that had a tuberculosis for was under cortisone for one year. Okay. So I don't know if that ha could have some effect on the on the outcome. Okay. But to tell the truth, the major difference is that I find out with a surgical dislocation, you have a much better view of what you are doing. Yeah. I really like the approach. I have to say. And, and you can fix the intra-articular abnormality, so you can repair label tears, you can debride chondral lesions, microfracture bits, small areas of head, cartilage dots, and then you see, actually what you see in the surgical dislocation is what damage there already is in the hip, which you don't tend to with anything else. 
also controversially, and this I really shouldn't talk about, I've done a few cases of the mild to moderate ones, stable, they fix with screws, and then do an arthroscopy at the same time and refashion the neck and sort the labrum and chondral lesion out at that time. And we're following those up to see what's going to happen to them. But that's very controversial. So that was a like a pilot series, just to see. What I always question myself when I look at the paper from Iowa about the natural history, history. Weinstein. Yes, uh, you know, Stuart uh, came up with this idea that uh, all these patients, even if you have like a 60 de degrees of displacement of angulation, you can really have a very good uh, uh, hip uh, records up to the age of 60. Yeah. So we only get the total hip in a very late stage. Yeah. So we are talking here when they do a surgical dislocation, a very high, you know, high tech procedure with a risk of AVN. And we have seen, like this picture yeah. of Toronto, that actually they really aggravated the natural history. Yeah. So I, I think. We but no, but what they, what they didn't have in that paper was pre op data on whether the head was yeah. dead already. And that's, so what we're trying to do is scan them before and after. So we know whether they're dead already before you do something, and then interoperatively monitor to see if the blood flow comes back. And that's the data we're collecting. So, and you can see it. You can see it pulsating. You can see uh, the Doppler signal. So that, but it's still a big thing. I completely agree with you to put them through. So it's all experimental. I don't think it's standard practice, and it won't be for a long time. And the same people keep publishing. So it's not as if, <laughs> and any time anyone else has tried to publish, they've had worse rates, and that doesn't, help to promote a technique. Yeah, that, that's exactly the key point. Yeah. You know, the good results come from the same group of people, yeah. and the bad results come from the rest of the people. So it's very difficult to reciprocate the same results. Yeah. And that makes us a little bit concerned. Do you have any experience here in India with the surgical dislocation? Dance, uh, dance procedures, you know, like the same way as he does them. Yeah. Because some of them present late to us, and we really require to resect part of the neck. Not much experience with the surgical dislocation for stickies. It's not, not that common. We don't get them so much. We really can't experiment with alternate approaches. The other thing is that, you know, in the, I would say that 10 years ago, probably, a lot of people just do a fixation in situ and do a, a not correct <coughs> osteotomy later on. Yes. And uh, intertrochanteric. And I have done a, lot, a few of those. And they did very well. Yeah. Most of them. I'll be talking about the next, in the next talk. I've got some okay. stuff. So there are some, so uh, there are three groups in the UK. Oxford's the main one where that's the standard. So that's Mike, Mike Benson started it, which is you fix it. And then about six months down the line, you do a, an Imhauser or Southwick or whatever, something below the Trichanta. Yeah. Um, it's also a very decent way of doing it. It doesn't sort out the shape of the femoral head because you're just creating a secondary deformity further. But it's a very safe thing because the AVN risk is zero. The other problem is when they will need a total hip replacement because then you are really making a change That's the other on issue. the anatomy of the upper femur. So, so you have to have another op to take the metal out, definitely. And then the third op that they eventually need becomes a bigger problem. Yeah. <coughs> Do you have a talk on that? I would, yeah, I'll talk on <laughs> the last FA. So, so it's... It will be done. <laughs> yeah, so we'll talk a bit. So, so this is someone who comes having had a slip epiphysis in the past and then had the metal work taken out. And they're complaining of groin pain on the right side with moderate activity for the last six months. And they've, ign they've ignored it for a while and it's just persisting. It's getting worse and worse. Um, so the question I was going to ask, uh, what sort of things can give you pain post-slip epiphysis when they come back to you and say that something's not right? And actually, all these things can cause pain. They can, they can have chondrolysis, particularly if they've had pin penetration while you're pinning it. They may have early arthritis. And we're starting to see more and more, if you start looking carefully, that they have an element of femoral acetabular impingement, or FAI. So when you look at this femoral neck, it's got a nice offset here. This one hasn't as much. And certainly here on the lateral view, anteriorly there's hardly any offset. So you can imagine that they've got an element of a cam lesion. It's a secondary cam lesion. So loss of the offset of the femoral head neck junction. 
and that then impacts upon the labrum and the adjacent cartilage. And this is the whole theory proposed by Reinhold uh, Ganz from Bern of FAI, whether it's primary or secondary. So Ganz described FAI as either a cam lesion, so there's an extra bit of bone or uh, on the femoral head neck junction, or pincer, where there's an extra bit of bone on the acetabular side, or a mixed picture where you have a cam and a pincer. And you can imagine the labrum gets crushed by either the cam or by the pincer, it gets pushed into the neck and starts to get damaged. And eventually that damage starts to spread to the cartilage adjacent to it in the, in the acetabulum. And Gans divided FAI into primary, and we now think the cause of primary FAI, you never see FAI naturally um, in, in childhood. You do see it in adolescence. If you take an x-ray out of 100 people in, standing in any room, 15% of people will have changes of FAI. So they'll have either a cam or a pincer. But only up to half of them will have symptoms from it. So there's something that predisposes you to develop that sort of hip, and then something that makes you get damaged. And it's usually the more active people who put their hips into positions where the cam hits against the labrum or the pincer squeezes the labrum down that start to get symptoms. So it's more common than you think, but it's not necessarily a problem unless you start getting secondary changes. And the, the theory now is that in adolescence, a part of the physis here extrudes and, and throws a bit of bone off anterolaterally onto the femoral head neck. That's why you don't see it before that final growth spurt. So most of them are primary, but you can be secondary, for example, post-slip and post-perthase, and we've talked about perthase before. In slips, what tends to happen is if you leave a hip and fix it in that sort of position where it's off from where it should be, you have a prominent metaphyseal area, a prominent neck. And that can hit up against the edge of the acetabulum. It can hit up and then distract the hip in certain positions, and sometimes you can see that on an arthrogram if you assess them, that it hits and then levers the head out. It can go into the hip, so it can erode its way in, or it can remodel and you end up with this metaphyseal area um, that's eroded away and causing another kind of deformity. So there are all sorts of things that can happen in slips. The tests we use to work out whether they have impingement, so often they've lost internal rotation, they tend to be slightly externally rotated. There's a sign called the Drennan sign, where as you flex a slipped epiphysis kid's hip up, it goes out into external rotation. It can never flex straight, because that head neck hits up, and you have to sort of abduct and externally rotate to get it round. But this is the test, the impingement test, and that tends to be positive. And then you put them into external rotation and abduction, the pain is relieved. So it's only in internal rotation and flexion that they get the pain where the cam lesion, the secondary cam lesion is hitting up against the labrum. You can also do this, which is put them off the end of the bed and internally external rotate in extension. And that again pushes the head neck junction up against the labrum and give you pain. We tend to do an MR arthrogram. So the stat girl that we saw earlier, she's got no offset, so it should really come in here and it doesn't because the slip is occurring. It's only a mild slip, but you've got this loss of offset and you can start to see the labral tear in the labrum already. So that should be a thick triangular structure and instead there's fluid going in already. Um, sometimes if you've got screws in, whether they're stainless steel or titanium, and you do an MRI scan, you can't see anything because of the scatter. So then you're better off doing a CT arthrogram and that will show you again a labral tear. Uh, and you can see the screw head is there. Now, we saw earlier that for an acute, stable, uh, unstable slip, we tend to reduce them acutely, do an osteotomy, put them back. So when you do that, you actually leave them with a very nice offset. And whether you do that through surgical dislocation or anterior approach, they're unlikely to get a secondary cam problem because you've corrected it acutely. It's more the stable, chronic ones where the head's been slowly slipping and then you fix it. What, you know, you're left with this sort of problem. This is mild. I mean, this is but she's symptomatic, and she, she's got an MRI arthrogram which shows a labral tear. So the question is, what do you do now? She's come, she's come, and she's tried to put up with it. She's three years down the line from having a slip pinned and then the screw taken out. You've done an MRI arthrogram, you know there's a labral tear, and she's got this loss of offset. So how many people would leave this alone? How many people would do something arthroscopically? 
How many people would do an open correction like a surgical dislocation? And how many people would do a flexion into trochanteric osteotomy? Seems like no one's going to do anything here, but that's fine. <laughs> we'll talk about all the, re all the th things you can do. So we've we do a lot of this, so we're, it, we're one of the national centers, so we get sent everything. So we've written recently, and this if anyone wants to read it, all the different techniques, including how to actually do them. It's in the JBJS um, on impingement following slip epiphysis. What are the different things you can do? And the options are an arthroscopic femoral neck osteochondroplasty, so take the cambridge now. You can do it arthroscopically assisted. You can do an anterior approach and then stick your arthroscope in and do it. So some people do it that way. So not actually fully distracting the hip. You just get down to the hip and just use a burr. You can do a surgical dislocation, you can do a proximal femoral osteotomy. If you look at the outcomes of not doing anything, so you don't realign, you just pin inside you and then nothing else, no other treatment, and follow them over the years. There are three papers with altogether around 150 odd patients that have been published. So this is just doing nothing and just following it long term and allowing that can deformity to, persi deformity to persist. Their higher hip scores can be very good in some cases and not as good in other cases. Some of them have AVN, which is interesting. They really shouldn't have AVN because they've been pinned inside you. So that's very interesting. And some of them have chondrolysis. But the scores vary, so not all of them do very well. I mean, Stuart Weinstein's classic paper from Iowa, where they followed them for many, many years, showed that the, the hips do tend to last a long time, but what it doesn't so the end point being a total hip replacement. But what the study doesn't look at is how symptomatic they are during that time. So the hips do last. It's a question of whether they can function and do the things that they want to do now. If you've got a very obese boy who does nothing with their hips, you're not going to try and put them through procedures to increase their range of motion or to make the x-rays look better because he's not going to be doing any sports. He doesn't really care. It's more the, the people who are more active and getting symptoms doing things that they can't get back to their sports, so they can't get back to their activities of daily living. So we tend to do the mild to moderate slips through arthroscopy, and again, we've written all about how to do it in the JPJS. Um, this is how I do it. So I don't know how many of you do arthroscopy here. Um, we do a lot. And this is a traction setup, so, so this is the leg you operate on, and it's on a traction table uh, using a standard sort of DHS-type drape. The other leg is out of the way, and this is the distracting device that you use to open the hip up by about a centimeter so you can get in. And this is a sort of cadaveric model. Um, this is where the abdomen would have been. That's the bottom of the leg. This is the right hip. So I tend to use two portals. One's an anterolateral portal, which is just anterior to the tip of the trochanter. And that's parallel to the floor generally and goes straight into the hip below the labrum. And then under vision, you put a second portal. That second portal, when arthroscopy was first described, was an anterior portal along the line of the anterior superiorlex spine. But the risk of hitting the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is very high, so they had a high incidence of lateral femoral nerve neuropraxia. So we've changed over the years. So if, if the anterior superiorlex spine is there, this forms a triangle between the three with that, that's called the distal anterolateral portal, is more distal, and has a better approach to the femoral head, neck, and the labrum. And then you put the second portal in under direct vision. So this case that we're just looking at, this is what you do. So this is arthroscopy. So the first thing is you go, you distract the hip, you look inside the central compartment, and you deal with any labral lesions or chondral lesions. And then you relocate the hip so that, I don't know if this is going to work, I might do. So then you can, you can see once the labrum is there, the femoral head is there, you've docked the hip and you can look at the femoral head neck junction and take away the cam lesion. It looks really yeah. destructive. In reality, it's a five millimeter burr. It looks bigger than it is. And you're not taking that much away. You're just taking enough to restore the offset of the femoral head neck. And once you've restored the offset, then you can move the hip around and then you, you take, you've taken the traction off and you can move around and, and show that the head-neck junction doesn't at any point hit the labrum. So you've then restored the offset here and that's, you just take away enough. I mean, you can keep going, I can keep taking more and more, but there's no need. 
You take enough so that you can keep flexing the hip up, and at no point does the femoral head neck hit the labrum, and that's enough. The more you take away, the more you risk fracturing the femoral neck. Um, so you tend to stop once you've got enough of an offset. Any labral tears you can repair back on, which is straight, easier to do these days. You can do with knots or without knots. There are lots of devices to help you do it. And then any areas of cartilage that aren't, um, that have been taken off, because often you tend to find in slipped epiphysis that this has been just grating away and bits of the femoral head have been flaked off. Um, and you've got this discrete chondral lesions, and we tend to microfracture those lesions. There's not much else you can do, to be honest. You can deprive the edges, microfracture it, get some bleeding going. People are starting to talk about things like chondrocyte transplants. I mean, it's a big, big step up, and no one's really done it yet. Um, and then, so this is the two-year follow-up of that girl, showing that you restored the offset. Now, what you haven't done is if you look at the angle of the femoral head to the neck, it's still at the same angle. And the only way you could restore that is by a surgical dislocation and cutting it and putting it back. And that's a much bigger intervention. So arthroscopy, there isn't much published in the literature. In fact, if you look at all the papers that have got a bigger series, there's only about 12 patients. In fact, this is going to change soon because Sanjeev Madan in Sheffield and us were putting our Paper, uh, up groups of patients together and publishing soon in the JBJS. Um, but there isn't much out there. The other thing you can do is do it through an, an anterior approach or a surgical dislocation and just take the this cam lesion off. Not do an osteotomy, but just take the cam lesion off. Um, so you do a neck lengthening osteotomy again and take that away. So that's one way of doing it. And again, it's the same group. This is the Boston group, very linked to the Byrne group. So Mike Millis and Young Joe Kim. And they did um, a group of patients, 19 patients who underwent osteoplasty or osteoplasty intertrochanteric osteotomy by, via GANS dislocation with one year follow up. So again, very limited follow up. And they said in the osteoplasty group, seven patients improved, four were unchanged, and two worsened. And in the osteoplasty osteotomy group, so they did, um, they took away the cam lesion, but then they also did an intertrochanteric osteotomy. Five of the six patients improved, which means one worsened. So they say it's a reasonable technique, but actually they're saying outcomes are bad, particularly if there's pre-existing cartilage damage. So if you see lots of cartilage damage, they don't tend to do well, but they only have one year follow-up, so that's difficult. But people are starting to publish their results. The other option for this sort of hip is an intertrochanteric osteotomy. So you say, I don't want to go anywhere near the femoral head because I might risk avascular necrosis. I don't particularly want to arthroscope the hip, but I want to just realign the hip so that the head sits better in the astebum and the femoral head and neck doesn't impinge like it's doing here. Um, and it's, that's a pretty straightforward osteotomy. You, you do it quite low uh, and just press the shaft of uh, of the distal into the proximal. So it looks like this. So you make it sit in a better position and it takes the head neck lesion away from the edge of the acetabulum. But it creates a secondary deformity in the proximal femur and they need another operation at some point to take all this metal work out. Lots of people have published on flexion into trochanteric osteotomies. There's lots of series. Uh, as a whole, even those patients can get an element of osteonecrosis. And that's quite worrying, that you're staying so far away from the femoral head and they still get AVN. Maybe the cuts ended up in places that they shouldn't have ended up. But there's an up, up to a 13% risk of osteonecrosis even with that. Oh, for complications, sorry. So there's lots of things you can do for secondary femoral stab impingement, but you need to work out whether A, it's worth intervening, and if you're going to intervene, what's the minimum thing you can do to give them the most function? The early literature is promising, but we still don't know about the long-term effects. You have to balance intervention risk against benefit. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Any questions? Or? Any questions? Most of this crowd will be very familiar with the No, I'm sure, yeah. But yeah. well, that's okay.
just to know what to watch out for. <laughs> Is there an announcement? Yes, about the feedback form. Okay. A small announcement for all the delegates. You need to give the feedback form at the end of the workshop uh, if you want to get the certificates. But that is as per the MCI guidelines. Thank you. I think I think it's a coffee break now. I don't know how long it's for. Fifteen minutes. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Apologies for arriving late, uh, but I believe uh, some some part of Perthes has already been discussed. So I'm just going to quickly go through a case, then talk about Perthes basics, and then talk about the indications of surgery, and then talk about some review of literature as we go on. Now, here we talk about an eight-year-old boy presented with an anterior thigh pain on the left side and he has had been having it for the past four months. The parents noticed a limp on the left side since three months. Level of activity slightly decreased. No history of trauma, no history of fever or, or any upper respiratory tract infection. On clinical examination, there was an antalgic gait on the left side, guarding, a little bit of guarding around the left hip with little limitation of rotations and abduction. Little discomfort on direct pressure on, over the femoral triangle, uh, limbland discrepancy of about a centimeter on the left side, shorter. This were the x-rays uh, when we saw them. And, uh, you know, we, we, we talk about a classification which I'll come to a little while later. Uh, there are several classifications, but we talk about presently that we, uh, at least in India, are using. Dr. Benjamin Joseph uh, has done a lot of work on uh, Perthes. And uh, this I would call it as a 1B uh, as far as Dr. Uh, Joseph's classification. And uh, uh, this, this is how the frog laterals and the AP were. And then we decided on doing a containment because it was an early. We'll talk about, we'll talk about uh, why and all in the later uh, side. But then a little bit of varicization with some derotation done in this case. After six weeks, this was the situation. We started off with touchdown uh, weight bearing after four weeks and full after six weeks. A good union. After four months follow up, I'm just telling you how the things progressed so that you understand what can be the little bit of complications that you have, may have to address at, the, at a later state. At this point of time, do you see the, the slide on the, the x-ray on the right? You see uh, the trochanter growing up. And then, uh, then we 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 thought I, we, we, there was a we, we had had a note of that and uh, thought that maybe we should have done something about the trochanter at the initial phase. Uh, and then there was a follow up at four years. Surprisingly, this guy never had an abductor lurch. And in fact, he had a fantastic abductor strength. But then we couldn't wait. Uh, we, the the X-rays were glaring. Uh, so we ended up doing a trochanteric arrest because he still had a little bit of growth remaining. Um, had a talk with the parents, the parents agreed and he's due for a screw removal now. So the outcome was one to two of uh, Stulberg. We are pretty happy with the way things progressed, but this one could have been prevented. Uh, it's commonly called Perthes disease. I'm not going through all this. I'm sure this has been covered. Uh, then there are some frequency and associations. Frequency male to female, four is to one, four in about a lakh population. There are associations of delayed bone age, disproportionate growth, mildly short stature, may be associated with SCFE trauma, steroid use, and uh, sometimes DDH. Etiology and pathogenesis, well, somebody is going to get a Nobel Prize if they find out the, pathoge etio the pathogenesis, uh, the etiology, but the rapid growth occurs, development of blood supply of the secondary ossification centers in the epiphy epiphysis, creating an interruption of an adequate blood flow and making these areas prone to avascular necrosis. So, interruption of the blood supply to the bones result in necrosis, removal of necrotic tissue and its replacement with new bones. So, that's the pathogenesis that nowadays the consensus is about. There is classically a painless limp, but there is definitely an anterior thigh pain. At least in my practice, most of these kids have anterior thigh pain at some point. Intermittent limp, especially after exertion, there is an abductor lurch, limited range of motion, pain, hip region. There are 
differential diagnosis, transient synovitis being probably the commonest ones. There could be trauma, infection, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, abscess, and so on and so forth. A MERS is a very interesting kind of a, a, a differential diagnosis which we need, we need to uh, keep in mind because uh, we need to follow up the patient to see how things are progressing to see whether there is actually avascular necrosis or not. Now, stages of evolution, as I talked about, uh, we have a stage of avascularity, 1A and 1B, string sign, early perthes, where you actually uh, talk about the extent of the femoral head, Sta stages of evolution, fragmentation, then there is fragmentation, again, 2A and 2B. Then you have a regeneration stage, where there is 3A and 3B, uh, after collapse, that is after the second stage, 2B, then you have this evolution going on. Uh, and the stages there is high finally is healing. So the whole process probably takes about four and a half years. And we know there is a lot of lot of work done by uh, Dr. Herring in uh, Texas Scottish Rite in Dallas, where he talks about 50% developing degenerative disease by six decade. And the most severely involved patients will have early hip disability. And uh, the most important classification in terms of prognosis is Stulberg. And a good long-term result uh, actually is directly proportional to what kind of sphericity of the head that you ultimately get. So you all, you basically are working towards that. And that's what, that's the message you need to be discussing with the parents when you are planning out the management. Extrusion is a very important factor. Well, there is an impaction, collapse, extrusion, and that can lead to a lot of pain, stiffness, degeneration, arthritis. There are problems of management, deformation of femoral head, enlargement of the head, capital physial, growth, growth impairment, early secondary degenerative arthritis of the hip. Trochantic overgrowth, we just talked about it. Deformed head, you can, you can have coxa magna. And then we have certain people, you know, some who don't operate on perthes, some who almost always operate, and those who pick and choose. So we need to be in that category, actually. Now, we some will develop a spherical heads on their own some will need containment for the spherical heads which will affect the natural progression of the disease towards the better and some you whether you do a containment thought it's not going to make any difference so we you need you need to understand uh, which category your particular patient belongs to now group one is a category which will develop spherical heads on their own so the usually the age is less than eight the area of involvement is less than 50 percent the lateral pillar height is maintained. In group two, you cannot do anything. I mean, we are talking about a, a, a set of patients in which whatever you do, it's not really going to make a difference. So that is age more than 12. Beyond the stage of reossification, which is probably more than, at least more than 2B. And group three needs containment. This is the kind of thing which we ought to be looking at and talking to about surgical uh, in, uh, intervention. Here, the age is 8 to 12, stage of fragmentation or early reossification, area of involvement more than 50%, lateral pillar height reduced to 50% or more. So there is a paper by Dr. Joseph, which is a very interesting paper. He talks about femoral head deformation occurs by stage 3A in untreated hips. Hence, if containment were to succeed, it should be achieved before this. Um, now, Treatment options making a difference, weight relief, all right, that's good, uh, but I, it's difficult to uh, keep the child, an active child, that to ironically uh, to be, uh, you know, in a weight relieving mode for about four, four years. But containment is what people are, you know, the consensus is going towards. Well, Petri, cast and all, I don't know whether you guys, have, I, I don't, I think it's obsolete. Uh, methods of containment, well, there are so many methods, you can use a lot of plate and screws. I personally like a right angle blade plate. And I, ideal implant uh, is, uh, um, you know, uh, where you basically need to medialize size, availability, cost, more so in India because, you know, everybody is talking about how much it costs and all that. Without, we don't have any insurance. Everybody knows that. I mean, insurance in the sense there's no medic, um, Medicare kind of stuff. Uh, then second surgery for implant removal. That's what you need to be talking about. So everybody, they should understand. What are the prerequisites for containment? Well, there has to be a good range of motion, re decent range of motion. Prove that the head is spherical. 
you can do an abduction frog lateral views prove that the head gets contained in abduction so the restor restoration of rotation uh, you in a spherical head you can do a various derotation if there is a restriction of internal rotation too much of restriction then you can probably do a various extension and then of course uh, valgus would be only in a restricted uh, restricted kind of abduction uh, yeah, this is what I was talking about. You need to demonstrate this before you are thinking about a various derotation or variousization. Here, uh, again, uh, just reiterating. Case selection for proximal femoral osteotomy gives good results. Accurate biomechanical and geometrical principles, safe to do. It's a, it's a relatively easy operation. So, and uh, just need to emphasize upon a separate operation for implant removal. The aims you have to maintain the best sphericity of the femoral head at the end of healing, prevent enlargement of the head, prevent or correct the trochanteric overgrowth, prevent early secondary osteoarthritis of the hip. Uh, well, you can achieve this by various means, but uh, that you can, but you need to be very aggressive with an older child, 7 to 12, relatively older, and girls, because the progression is pretty fast in girls. Extrusion does not normally occur when less than half the physis is involved. So let's just review, reviewing the literature. Uh, there's a study by Skaggs, Dolo, and uh, um, on leg cal perthes disease, where they talk about it being a self-limiting disease, poor prognosis, uh, when onset of symptoms is after eight years, lateral head subluxation is there, involvement of more than 50% of the head with collapse of the lateral pillar, and a combination of aspherical femoral head with an incongruous joint. And cornerstones of treatment is maintenance of hip motion, relief of symptoms, and containment. More so, more or less, you know, we've been following that. And reviewing literature again, Evans, uh, DeLuca, and Gage, a comparative study of ambulation, abduction, bracing, and various derotation osteotomy in the treatment of severe leg cal perthes disease in children over six years. Uh, in fact, uh, this is the place where I did my fellowship, so I, I know about this paper. Uh, uh, Evans, IK et al., JPO, uh, this is the same person where they talked about 36 patients with the severe Perthes disease. It was a retrospective study. It was a comparative study. The percentage of the establer coverage, extent of the lateral head subluxation, age of the child affected outcome, various ne uh, neck shaft angle and limb length discrepancy result resulting, uh, it was just a temporary phase as, as per this study. And they concluded that the results of the children in this age group treated by both modalities was same provided used appropriately. When we talk about that, we talk about the abduction, ambulatory abduction bracing to be on full time for such a long time, which is practically not possible. So more and more people are actually uh, preferring a surgical containment. So that's it. Thank you. You want me to take questions? Yeah, please. See, um, you know, we don't have a proper study, Indian study, but I being in a tertiary center, I get a lot of referrals. So I, I don't think that actually means anything. I mean, uh, I don't know, maybe. We are asking, are your number of cases going down? Uh, no, not really. Not really. Yeah. Perthes. But how do they explain that? So they've done an epidemiological study and shown that it's almost as if something's vaccinated against. It's the same mode of epidemiological disappearance as you'd see in an infectious disease that you have a vaccination. So there's something that's so there's potentially an infectious cause okay. that's disappearing. Or it's a nutritional thing and people's prosperity. So in terms of their median income, etc., it's been going up. All right, that's that's uh, Interesting to note that there is an infective uh, angle to it. But 
but it works. But it works the other way too. So in the Scandinavian registries, they have still have a high incidence, and there's no problem with prosperity or lack of prosperity. So there's something else. There's no change. There's no change, and there's no. There aren't um, high income, low income individuals. They're all in the middle. So we remain the same. They, they, they remain the same. Low income people are going. Do you want me to uh, continue with the de uh, anything? Yeah, yeah, please, 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 please. Yeah. No, no, I've got, I've got one DDH talk, which is the first talk. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, sorry. Let, let's yeah. go first uh, to another question about this, because I'm really impressed with the work of Benjamin Joseph. But whenever, and I'm, I'm really a fan of the Vero Zostia, but I have to say that I'm dealing with this thing, that whenever I'm talking to the parents, say, your kidney is a Vero Zostia, I'm sometimes talking about three or four. Because one is a varus osteotomy. Sometimes you have to end up by doing a valgus osteotomy because you have seen here, or you have to do something about the greater trochanter. Usually there is an overgrowth. So either you do an epiphysiodesis at the time of the varus Yeah, that, that's, that's what needs to be done. That's yeah. A, but I see some of the cases, and this is my question to you. What is the limit for your varus osteotomy? 110 degrees. Not before, below that. That's, that's the, I just showed you a paper, in fact, I mean, that's probably a smaller study, but that's the place where, you know, it was grilled into us that, you know, don't worry about, I mean, obviously, if you are above 110 degrees, don't worry too much about the limnant discrepancy and uh, the lurch and all things will settle down. So that's the way I was taught. I don't know what, what has ensued over time, but I think that's what I generally follow and things are working out. In this case, I could have prevented it. You know, to be honest, I thought, you know, it would, uh, uh, in fact, uh, you know, when I was doing my fellowship, Dr. Deluca was there. He was the director of the gate lab. And he used to talk a lot about this uh, trochantric overgrowth, you know, the, the articular uh, trochantric distance and all that stuff. At that time, it, I mean, we used to discuss, but it didn't really register how, to, but now, you know, thinking back, I can relate more to what he was saying. Uh, he used to be pretty sharp in uh, the way he handled things. Till you come. You, you can go ahead, please. Thank you. It'll come up in a second. So we're going to do a series of talks now about developmental dysplasia of the hip. Here we go. Um, this was actually going to be the first talk of the day. So I plan to talk a little bit about where I work and invite any of you, want, if you're coming through London or want to come and visit, please, please come and visit. So I work at uh, two hospitals which are part of the same group. One's called St. Bartholomew's Hospital. It was founded in 1123. And it's the oldest continually functioning hospital in the world. So it's nearly a thousand years old and it looks the same when it's open and it still looks the same now. Nothing's changed, even the inside, um, <laughs> honestly. Um, and we're very, very lucky because it's the place where William Harvey discovered the circulation of blood or discovered how blood circulates. Um, Percival Pott worked there, a Paget of Paget disease. John Abernethy described mitral stenosis in the mitral valve for the first time. Um, the other hospitals, and, and that was in the richest part of London, so it's, it was within the walls of this old city of London. At this, a few hundred years later, in 1740, the Royal London Hospital was built in the poorest part of London, which is where the immigrants and the poorest people of London all congregated, and that's the Royal London. And actually the facade of it, when it opened to the facade now, is still the same, it's a historical building, so you can't get rid of the facade. And the sorts of people who worked there include uh, Florence Nightingale, James Parkinson, uh, Down of Down Syndrome. The Elephant Man's bones are buried in our museum, if you want to come and have a look at the Elephant Man. 
Michael Jackson tried to buy the elephant man's bones in 1982, and we refused, because Michael Jackson's a bit mad. Well, he was. Uh, and Henry Souter did the first operation on the mitral valve there, talking about Abernethy and mitral stenosis. So last year, we opened our new hospitals. And this is a 1.5 billion pound investment from the government. And it's probably the last government initiative to build a new hospital, because as a result, I'm sure they've gone bankrupt. Um, so this is Bart's, it's a new Bart's, it's mainly, we do our outpatient work there, and it's mainly cancer and cardiac, but we do all our outpatient work there. And the Royal London in the middle, uh, f middle six floors, uh, the children's hospital, and we work out of there and do all our trauma and operating there. And then we merged with two other hospitals and became the biggest healthcare organization in Europe, and it's called Bart's Health, and it's a, it's a massive, massive organization. There's 16 of us that work there of which uh, we have four full-time pediatric orthopedic surgeons, and there's another 16 working at the two other hospitals nearby. So there's 32 of us. And that leads on to our clinic. So we do a clinic once a week, which is a one-stop hip clinic. That's uh, Claudia Meitzen, who's trained with Graf. In, in fact, her father was Graf's orthotist, uh, used to make the harnesses for Graf's... Um, babies who had DDH. And so she grew up there, was trained by him there, and then came and started with us as a consultant a few years ago. This is Matthew Barry, one of my colleagues, uh, Rosie Jalan, who's a radiologist and does our uh, ultrasound. So we have this clinic that's once a week that all our children who are suspected of having DDH, 